Public Schools is proud to welcome you to the Performing Arts Center and the Roland D. Powell Convention Center. Our program will begin in just a moment, but first we have a few reminders. The Convention Center is a non-smoking facility, and while we encourage your taking photographs and interacting with WCPS on social media using our hashtag WeAreWorcester, please make sure that at this time your cell phones and other devices are silenced. Please note that flash photography is not allowed during today's program. And lastly, in case of emergency, exits are clearly marked and located to your left and rear of the Performing Arts Center. And now, to begin our program, please rise as our all-county chorus and a countywide JROTC color guard enter the stage to present the colors for our national anthem. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the, our kickoff of 2017-18. It's my great pleasure this morning to introduce some of the special guests who are with us today. I'd like to take a moment to recognize our extraordinary Board of Education. These seven remarkable public servants from across our county are an integral part of our success. Board of Ed members, as I call your name, please stand and remain standing until we can show all of you our appreciation. First, our Board of Ed Vice President, 
Mr. Doug Dryden. Board of Ed member, Barry Brittingham. Board of Ed member, Mr. Eric Cropper. Our newest Board of Ed member, Ms. Elena McComas. Ms. Elena McComas, excuse me. Mr. Bob Rothermill. And the longest serving Board of Ed member in the state of Maryland, Ms. Sarah Thompson. Now, you may have noticed I only introduced six of our Board of Ed members. That wasn't by accident. It's my pleasure to now welcome your former colleague, our current Board of Ed President, Mr. Bill Gordon. I would like to personally share some well wishes with you today. Mr. Gordon. Wow. Thank you, Dr. Quinn, and good morning. Good morning, good morning to each and every one of you. What an amazing event we have on tap for you here today. On behalf of the entire Worcester County Board of Education, we want to thank Mr. Taylor and his team of professionals for bringing back this opening event and for making it a true celebration, not just for teachers, but for all staff members. Let's give Mr. Taylor and his staff a big round of applause. We are so very proud to be an integral part of this prize-winning team. Being a part of the Worcester County Public School family is truly an eye-opener when it comes to what a team can achieve when they work together. Having looked at our students' incredible performance on our recent assessments, you should truly take this time, you should truly take this time to celebrate. Your tireless effort is the reason that Worcester County continues to be a leader, not only in the state, but across the nation. Each person in this room plays a role in the success of our school system, and we want to extend to you, each and every one of you, on behalf of the entire Board of Education, our most sincere thanks for the time, dedication, and talent you bring to our schools every day. That bears repeating. We wish to extend to you, every one of you, a sincere thanks for your time, your dedication, and your talent that you bring to the classroom every day and to our school. You are the reason our kids reach new heights. Please, please, please continue to give them the best you have every day. Please continue to do as your shirt reminds you. Please continue to make a difference. We all, the entire board, wishes you another an incredible year. Thank you, all of you. Thank you, Mr. Gordy. Let's give him and our Board of Education another round of applause. For all of you. First of all, thank you all for coming out on this beautiful day. And good morning to everyone. It is indeed my joy to be a part of this program today, and I am honored to be able to introduce our elected officials that have joined us today in celebration of the opening of our schools. First, we have great support from our state delegation. If you would please stand when I recognize you. With us today are our delegate, Mary Beth Carosa, delegate Charles Otto, and I haven't seen him yet, but delegate, excuse me, Senator Jim Mathias. Thank you very much for sharing in our celebration today. At our local level, we are so fortunate to have forged an incredibly strong relationship with our county commissioners. Without their support, 
Much of what we do would be impossible. I ask that each of you stand when I recognize you, please. Joining us today, Vice President Ms. Diana Purnell, Mr. Chip Bertino, Mr. Bud Church, Mr. Ted Elder, Mr. Merrill Lockfall, and Mr. Joe Matressi. Please join me in showing our And now, I would like to welcome to the stage the President of our County Commissioners, Mr. Jim Bunning, for some remarks on behalf of the County Commissioners. Mr. Bunning. Good morning. Good morning. I suppose some of you were a little upset this morning when you walked out and it was uh, raining so bad and it's going to get worse later today. But we are truly blessed here in Worcester County and the Eastern Shore. So before I start, I'd like to urge everybody to keep the, the people and the families and the emergency personnel in Texas in your thoughts and prayers. Amen. Wow. Uh, I was talking to Superintendent Taylor, and it looks like we might have to her, her hold our budget hearing next year here with this crowd. <laughs> On behalf of my fellow commissioners, I want to let you know that we are thrilled to take part in the Worcester County Public Schools kickoff meeting for 2017-2018 school year, where great things await our students. I'm sure it comes as no surprise to anyone in this room that Worcester County Public Schools are without equal in the state. I believe a number of factors contribute to this success. Our school facilities are state-of-the-art, and our students have access to cutting-edge learning tools. But the most essential ingredient in this recipe for success is right in front of me in this audience. It's you, the dynamic teachers and teams whose unique gifts and talents blend together in the classroom to create the sparks that ignite the fires of learning. As you return to the classroom this fall, please know that the commissioners will do our part to support your work for continuing to work closely by continuing to work closely with our Board of Education partners and Superintendent Taylor to provide needed resources so you can focus on what matters most, teaching our students. On behalf of the county commissioners, I wish all of you the best in the coming school year. Thank you. Tuesday they're not going to be there. They're going to be ready to go. 
Good morning, Worcester County. Good morning. It is so great to stand up here and to look out and to see you and greet you this morning as you come in today. I don't know about you, but this morning at about 3.30, I was wide awake. I couldn't lay still. I got up. I walked past my house, went to the restroom three times. I did everything. Uh, but I was so excited about what we're, we're here today about and to celebrate you and to thank you for the job that you do here in Worcester County Public Schools for our kids. We have a speaker today, and I certainly don't want to take any of his thunder if any of you have heard him online or through the social media. I think we're in for a real treat. But I'd like to share just a few minutes my thoughts about our schools and about our school system. First and foremost, I want to thank, uh, I didn't get a chance to come out and introduce, and John and Steve did such a wonderful job. I want to thank our Board of Education and our elected officials who make our school system a priority. Can we give it up for them? One more time? November the 1st, our Board of Education gave me an opportunity for a dream to come true. Back in 1978, when I graduated from Stephen Decatur High School, now you can figure out my age, go ahead. <laughs> when I graduated from Stephen Decatur High School and was afforded the opportunity to go by my parents to go to college, I never dreamed that I would be coming back to the system that I love, the system that I grew up in, the system that made me partially who I am today. And there were people like you, people like you sitting in this audience, who made the difference in my life to pursue an education, to pursue a dream. And we have that opportunity come next Tuesday to make sure we are making dreams come true for those young people who will enter our schools. You know, we don't have the opportunity uh, to raise every child, but we have the opportunity to affect the life of every child that comes through our school system. Not all our kids have two-parent homes. Not all our kids have a one-parent home. Many of us can't relate to that because we didn't grow up that way. Some of us can, and you've persevered, as my mom has taught me about perseverance. You've persevered, and look where you are today. And you can truly affect the lives of our young people. I mentioned parenting. <laughs> I have two special guests today who were introduced. It's my pleasure to introduce them because they are my mentor, my very best friends, and I'm so glad still at 57 years of age and they in their late 70s still support their children every single day. Plus, I wanted them to see the wonderful atmosphere that we have here in Worcester County. Would you just for 10 seconds give it up for my mom and dad? Please give them up. Certainly, I'm very proud to call them my parents. And they've given me a life um, that is second to none. And I don't just talk about the things that we expect from parents, but a life of lessons. And as I said, I'm blessed to have that, but our kids and some of our kids don't have that opportunity, and we have to be a game changer for those young people starting next Tuesday. I had a situation last year where I was riding to work one day, and I was riding down the road, and I go by kids every morning waiting for the bus. In fact, I try to beat the buses in my area so I don't get behind them. You know <laughs> but this morning, I happened to be behind or ahead of the buses, and it started to rain. And I pulled off the side of the road because there was a, a little boy in third grade standing, and it was pouring rain. I mean, just pouring rain. He didn't have a jacket on. In fact, I pulled by and I stopped and I backed up and I pull, pulled over and I knew the bus was probably a half a mile down the road because I had seen it in my rearview mirror and I asked him to get in. And he was shy. He was a little weird about <laughs> <laughs> But when he got out of the car, as the bus approached, said, here comes the bus. I told him who I was. I told him I worked in the schools with him. Uh, when he got out of the car, he said to me, probably only 10 words he said all day, he said, thank you, sir. Oh, 
You see, we don't know when we affect the lives of kids. Come on. We don't know when that moment's going to happen. And I'm sorry, uh, I'm an emotional guy. And when it comes to these kids, I'm doubly emotional, I will tell you. And we don't know when we're going to have that opportunity to pull off the side of the road or take one home, as I know a lot of you do, or go make that home visit, as I know a lot of you do. But we have that chance. And that's what makes this teaching profession great. This is the first year that I said we're going to bring everybody that works in this school system to this meeting. Because I want to tell you something, school nurses, custodians, educational assistants, cafeteria workers, bus drivers, secretaries, no matter who you are, you play an important role in the lives of our kids. And you are just as For a minute that your job is not important because it is. You make schools what they are along with the teachers and the educators who work in our buildings. One of the things that I've always been impressed in Worcester County Public Schools by you is we've always put kids first. And as long as I'm afforded the opportunity to be your superintendent of schools, kids will always come first. You know, every decision that we will make will be based around, and those who have worked with me have heard me say this over and over again, if it's best for kids, we're going to try it. You see, I don't want to be a system of schools. I want to be a school system. Right. The school system is a team, and Worcester County Public Schools is a team. And everyone in this room is valued. I know when I became the superintendent, I talked to each of the staffs here about, we get kids in three phases. We either get them a red light kid, a yellow light kid, or a green light kid. Start with the green light. The green light kids are kids like me. They came from two parents, had a winter coat when it was winter, had new school clothes every year, had heat in my house, had three meals on my table. I went to school and all I needed was just that little bit of pushing and everything worked. And I would say about a third of our kids are in today's world or in our school system are the green light kids. And then another third that comes to us are yellow light kids. <coughs> They're right on that fence. And we make the difference of whether they will fall to the left of the fence or the right of the fence. We have to make them fall to the right of the fence, the right side of the fence. And then the other third is the kids that we struggle with, the kids that don't have two parents, the kids who don't have a structure that's conducive for living, to live in, the kids who don't have a, a meal and depend on our school meals each and every day. You see, I shudder every time we have a three-day weekend. I love it as much as you do, but what I shudder about is kids are going an extra day without food. And those of us that have seen this and have worked around those kids know that they struggle a little bit more when they come back. I love the Christmas holidays. I love the Easter break. I love all the things we take for a break. But I also worry about those young people that we affect each and every day and what they're doing. Because I know they don't have the things that we would like for them to have. So I challenge you this morning as we begin a new year. Yes, it's about teaching academics. Yes, we've got to make sure we've got good test scores. But it goes deeper than that. It goes about relationships. And I challenge you this morning to build a relationship with every one of your children. Encourage them. Love them. Greet them every morning with a smile, even when we don't want to smile. And we're all there some days. Let them know you care about them beyond the classroom. Let them know that you're there for them when those troubled days come for them. It's easy. We're all intelligent, educated people in this room. We know our craft. We know how to get it done. But let them see not that you like them, not that you love them, but that you also have a passion for them. There's a huge difference between liking what you do and having a passion for it. 
And trust me, adults and kids alike know the difference by the way you act mm -hmm. and by the way you greet them. This is a great school system. I am completely honored and humbled to stand before you today as your superintendent of schools. I can't thank that Board of Education enough for giving me that call late last September to say you're our guy. I'll never forget that call. And I can't thank him. I want to thank him every day. I can't thank the county commissioners enough that as of last November the 1st, we built a relationship and joined hands together and said, you know, we all can't have what we want, whether it's you or the commissioners, but we're going to do what's best for our kids and our community. And I can tell you that since last November the 1st, in my relationship with them, they, to a person, want what's best for our school system and our kids. And I, again, thank you guys for that. <laughs> and I can't thank, thank the delegation enough, the Delegate Otto, Delegate Rosa. Senator Mathias, I communicate with them on a regular basis, basis, and they too truly love Worcester County Public Schools and what we're doing. I close with this. I challenge you to do the things above and beyond your teaching talents this year for our kids. Love them, encourage them, embrace them. And I challenge you to take a step forward and be a game changer. Step out of your comfort zone like I stepped out of mine this morning by dancing in front of you. <laughs> I know my mom is about to have a heart attack when she to do it. But I did it because I want to tell you, sometimes we have to take chances mm -hmm. to make a difference. You are the greatest group of people that I could ask to work with. No, you don't work for me, we work together. And together, we're going to make a difference this year in Worcester County Public Schools, and I thank you all in advance for what you're going to do, what you're doing now, and we're going to have a great year. Thank you all very much. <laughs> now it's my privilege to introduce Worcester County Public Schools last year was, again, we're the greatest school system uh, anywhere. We had both the Maryland Principals of the Year, uh, the Secondary High School Principal, and the Elementary uh, School Principal. And I've asked those two uh, Maryland State Principals of the Year, Dr. Annette Wallace and Dr. Michael Brown, would you welcome them? <laughs> because I often um, share with people that there's a difference between excitement and passion. Passion is like a fire, it just keeps on burning. And so I think really for us today, Mr. Taylor just ignited um, that fire and I'm so excited to hear Principal Kafile speak this morning. Yes, as many of you already know that for us, September is the start of a new year, not January. We are the ones who truly make a difference in so many lives that we come in contact with each and every day. We are the best in the state, yeah. and I'm there to say that we're the best in the nation. Yeah. That's because of the work, the dedication, and what we all have in our hearts, which is to make sure that our students succeed. So this morning we're excited to introduce to you a highly regarded urban public school educator in New Jersey for over 20 years. Principal Kafile distinguished himself in the classroom and as a school teacher. As an elementary school teacher in East Orange, New Jersey, he was selected as the school district's teacher of the year. As a principal, he led the transformation of four different schools, including the mighty Newark Tech which went from a low-performing school in need of improvement to recognition by U.S. News & World Magazine three times as one of America's best high schools. 
One of the most sought after educational speakers in America, Principal Kefile, has delivered more than 1,000 conference keynotes and professional development workshops since leaving his principalship in 2011. As an expert in the area of attitude transformation, Principal Kefile is, leading the authority, is a leading authority for providing effective classroom and school leadership strategies towards closing what he coined the attitude gap. Defined as the gap between those students who will have, who, excuse me, who will have the will to achieve excellence and those who do not. He is also the author of eight books, which include the national bestseller, Closing the Attitude Gap, Motivating Black Males, The Principal 50, and The Teacher 50. Principal Kefile is the recipient of over 100 educational, professional, and community awards, which, is the, which includes the prestigious Milken Edu National Education Award, the National Alliance of Black School Educators Hall of Fame Award, and the City of Dickinson, Texas, proclaiming February 8th, 1988, as Barute Kefile Day. And now, please welcome Principal Kefile. case I'm listening to the end of the bio and the bio says that I was recognized in Dickinson Texas and I, I hear that name that city every time my bio was read but I haven't been back to Dickinson since 1998 when they when they named the day after me so my mother called me the day of um, the day of Harvey when it started and she said you know that city Dickinson that honored you is underwater and I said, wow, and I started paying attention to it probably more than I was Houston. So I just want to say I would be remiss, I think we all would be, if I didn't just say prayers to everybody impacted yes. by Harvey right now. With that said, once again, folks, it, it, it's, it's great to be here. This is the time of the year to be here. But I, I got to talk to my grandmother real quick. Uh, my grandmother, she wanted me to be a professional basketball player. <laughs> She wanted me to be in the NBA because I played basketball in high school and I was okay. <laughs> so her dream for me was to be in the NBA. I played center in high school and the average center back in those days was about anywhere from 6'10 to 6 uh, to 7 foot 2. And here I was 6'1 playing center. And it's the only position that I knew. So she wanted me to be this professional basketball player. She, she talked about it all the time, and when she saw I wasn't moving in that direction to even playing basketball, she was disappointed. So to fast forward, years later, I was named Teacher of the Year in my district in New Jersey, East Orange, and then the county, and was a runner-up for the state. So I was all excited, and I, I dashed to her house and told her, I said, Nan, I'm Teacher of the Year. She, you know, she was excited, I cried, she cried. But then once we got past that, she said to me, but I want you to be in the NBA. <laughs> so if I could talk to her for a second, hey, Nana, it didn't happen, you know that. It wasn't meant to happen. But look at this audience in front of me. These are all educators and folks who are associated with education. I'm doing work this morning that's much more significant than bouncing a basketball, trust me. Yeah. Let's do some work, folks. You know, they, I was told there's, there's everybody here today, and I, was, I told a few people backstage, this is how you start a school year, when you bring everybody. This is what it's all about. So I'm, I'm told that there are custodians and maintenance workers in the, in the house. Is that true? Are you here? Yeah. Let me tell you, and, you know, I asked backstage right before I came out, I said, how much time do I have? And they said, take whatever the Lord tells you to do. And I said, you don't want me to do that. 
you know, I'm a big Luther fan, and I'm not even going to tell you the last name. If you don't know Luther, then you don't know Luther. Yeah. If I have to say Vandross, then you don't know Luther. So, I'm a big Luther fan. And Luther always said, those of you who ever saw him in concert, he always said, I'm just going to take my time singing these love songs. Right, so I'm, I'm, I'm just going to take my time, y'all. We got custodians in the house. We got maintenance workers in the house. Let me, let me tell you something. I was a principal for 14 years. And I'm not here today because I have an ability to speak to an audience. That's not what got me on these stages. What got me on these stages is the work that I did over the past, not the past, but over 21 years before I became a full-time self-employed speaker. But I could not have done this without my custodial crew, without my maintenance crew, because I can't lead effectively, and my teachers cannot teach effectively in a sloppy-looking building. Is this not what for staff and children to walk into an oasis. Superintendent talked about that third that we struggle with most. And a lot of times that third that we struggle with most, it's justifiable. Because so many young people come into school with challenges that are so overwhelming. Challenges that are this wide, that high, and we expect them to come to school excited about a math lesson. Not taking into consideration what life is like outside of school. So in order for me to alleviate that challenge, one of the things that I have to do is ensure that they walk into an oasis every day. That they walk into a building that's, that's just full of promise and hope. Immaculately clean, impeccably clean. Now, I can look seriously and earnestly and educate this child because the building is a place that's inviting. So I salute the custodial staff, the maintenance staff. But then on the flip side, that's not all you do as educators. Because see, if, if, if you're working for Principal Cafele, I'm going to empower that staff to be my teachers as well. So custodians are teaching. Custodians are motivated. Custodians are inspiring, not just cleaning a building. As the theme says this morning, you know, says, says we are Worcester, right? So another way of saying that is we are one, because that's essentially what it's saying. So we're one, and support staff is a part of that one. So that's custodians, but we, we got a whole lot of other folks in the room. Secretaries here? Yeah. Once again, I'm 14 years as a principal. They tell me I did a pretty good job. Not without my secretarial staff. Oh no. Oh no. As important as the assistant principals were to me, they ain't as important as I'm secretary. Oh no. Break it down. Secretary is the one that kept me afloat. Secretary is the one that kept me, kept me effective as a leader. Because the secretary is doing all that behind the scenes work that quite frankly, I really don't want to do. That's what they do. There's no effective school, high performance school that does not have high, high performance secretarial staff along with it. They go hand in hand. Miss Kennedy, I would say to her often, I said, Miss 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 Kennedy, play, pray for me. And every day her response was, Kefele, I took care of that when I got up this morning. She said, I am your prayer warrior. So that's that secretary of staff. But but there's so many others. Are there any cafeteria kitchen workers in the house? I keep saying I couldn't do this thing by myself. I can't do this without the kitchen. I can't do it. Because see, the cafeteria workers, the kitchen workers, they're not just serving lunch. I empower them too. As you hand them that tray, give them a word of encouragement. 
Give them a word of inspiration. Give them something of substance to get them through the day beyond the meal. See, they're significant as well. They would come to me all the time. They said, Principal Kefele, let me recite the school mission for you. Let me recite the school vision for you because we're part of this thing. We live in this thing. We, we're soaring with everybody here. The kitchen staff, the cafeteria staff, they're critical as well. We got a security in here? No security? <laughs> Y'all don't need security. I got you. I got you. But if there's something somewhere across the yard, security, let them know Principal Cafele said they appreciate it as well. <laughs> but you know, they, they, there's some other folks. The nurse here today? Nervous wasn't just for my students. <laughs> See, you know, as, as, as a leader and all the principals in the house, you, you can relate to this. There's certain folks that we need to lean on too. You know, so sometimes I just need to go to that nurse's office and lay my head down. <laughs> Give me some strength. See, but the nurse, you know, the nurse is like the bartender. <laughs> Nurse know everybody's business. And you, 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 the custodian does too, I might add. But you, you need them folks to love, love. Sometimes I need some underground stuff. Hey, nurse, hey, custodian. What, what they really say, right? So, you know, they, 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 they're crucial too. So when, when young people be falling ill in school, you know, virus, whatever the case may be, sickness, <laughs> nurse is there. And, and nurse is susceptible to the same illness, but nurse got to be there. That's, that's the warrior on the staff, too. So, so school nurse, I salute you. And they, they, they yeah, you are here. There, there's so many others. I, I don't want to leave anyone out. You know, you, you got the librarian. They're, they're, they're so good. Cool. So you in here, you in here, librarians? Yeah, yeah. You got the counselors. Folks still trying to call you guidance counselors, and we drop guidance as just counselors now. I get it. But the counselors. Man, you, 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 you guys are crucial. That's another one I used to go sneak in their office and just you know, yeah. hang out in here for about five minutes. Right? You know, so the, the counselor, the, I mean, just, and the counselor wears so many hats. You know, just, just, it, just endless responsibility. But let me tell you, I, I salute the counselors to get today. Again, we are one. We are Worcester, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right or not. My wife said Wor Worcester. I said it's not Worcester. I said it, I think it's Worcester. So I went to the cafe, and then I'm here in Worcester. And I went to the when I was at the hotel, I said to the clerk, I said, "Look here, man, I, I gotta ask you something. I'm a little embarrassed about this. But, but I, I'm getting ready to talk to 1200, and I can't botch this up, right?" I said, "Pronounce this county." He said, uh, "Worcester," like real quick, like that. I said, I said, well, hold up, man, I'm fucking the 1200. Slow that down. Worse. Come on, man. Is that, like, is that O saying er or O? So he said, like, something that sounded like O and E, right? So, so I'm, I'm just going to stick to worst, right? I, I don't know. But you know, I'm talking about. Thing superintendent said, but when he said what's that, I was locked in. That's how you say it. Right? So, so, but there, there's, there's so many folks. I mean, the, the, the school psychologist, the school social worker. I mean, they, they, there's, there's, there's endless folks in a building. You got the administration. You got the dean of students. You got the substitute teacher. You got the power professional. I mean, it, it, it's just endless. I know I'm missing somebody, and I, I, I didn't forget the teachers, but I'm, I'm saving you for last. But there, there's so many that do so many different things to make the organization work. The school system, 
work. But you got those teachers on the front line, yes. which I always say, the most important profession on the entire planet. There is nothing. There is nobody more significant, more noble than a classroom yeah. teacher. Folks like, like to come at me philosophically. Principal DeFay, like, wait a minute, man. You know, the, the spiritual leader, the, 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 the medical practitioner, the, the etc. I said, wait, 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 wait. They, they got to go through a teacher. They can't do their work without going through a teacher. Everybody's got to go through a teacher in order to get there. So I pride myself, I don't bash teachers. I don't beat up on teachers. I, I can't do it. Because what you do is too significant. So let's, let's look at a few things. Because you guys got a big day coming next week. And, and there's, there's, there's this, this, this young person, for sake of discussion and, and, and you maximizing my time, let's say that there's this, this young man out here in the world somewhere. He graduated from this district just this past year, walked across a stage like this, received his diploma, and now he's, he's out here, he's, some, he's at some university, or he's out here embarking on some career, or he's in the military serving our country, yes. or he's doing something based on what he received. I don't, I don't know what that is. It's not important in, in, in terms of this discussion. All I know is that he left out of here ready to face the world. Right. But let me describe this young man. You've seen him before. He was born into poverty. He was born there. He was born with a hand that was so overwhelming that if many of you were to change places, trade places with him for a day, Many of us in the room, perhaps myself as well, wouldn't last 10 minutes in his shoes. That's how overwhelming life is. That's how challenging life is. That's why it's so critically important that the environment that he walks into every day has him in mind. That that environment is geared toward him. So here he is. He, he's got challenges. He didn't get the expensive vocabulary at home. He didn't get the academic preparation the way the other third got it at home. So he didn't come here with a million words ready to speak. He didn't come here with the math skills. He didn't come here with the experiential background that some of the other students came in with. But he did come in with some behavioral challenges. He did come in with a lack of motivation. He did come in detached from the process. So now, we all knew him early on, pre-K, kindergarten, first grade, second grade. We knew this young man. And then he went on through the grades. And his behavior and his lack of motivation became, became progressively that much more challenging. And then he moves on. He's in the fourth, he's in the fifth, he's in the sixth grade. Now he's in the middle school grades. And while he's in the middle school grade, somewhere around seven or eight, he meets one of you. He meets one of us. And the one of you that he met, you didn't say anything any different from anybody else. You gave him these four magical words that he heard all every year. He didn't hear it at home, but he would hear it in the school environment. And those words were, I believe in you. He heard that from one of you, but he heard it a zillion times before you said it. But he heard you say it. It didn't really mean much. It went in one ear and out the other. But then you said it again. And again. And again. And again. You kept saying, I believe in you. But then you didn't stop there. You said, I'm there for you. 
You said you are somebody. You said you are extraordinary, young man. You said you are awesome. You are outstanding. I will never, ever quit on you. I will never, ever give up on you. Because you are phenomenal. You kept saying this, somebody. I don't know who you are, where you're sitting up there, down here. I don't know. But it's you. And that young man, after a few months, he heard you. He heard you. But it took some time. And you were persistent. And you didn't, you didn't cave in after the first time he rejected you. Maybe that first time he told you all. Maybe that first time he used profanity toward you. Maybe that first time his parent used profanity toward you. Maybe that first time that he told you, I don't like you. You didn't back down. Because you said the mission is bigger than these words. So you kept on telling him, you're somebody. I don't care what you do, I'm there for you. And after, after several months, that kid, let me give that kid a name. Let's call him Jalil. Jalil, he heard you. And he believed you. He believed you. And you saw a shift. You saw a shift in his demeanor. You saw a shift in his posture. You saw a shift in his facial expression. You saw a shift in his energy and enthusiasm. You saw a shift in his academic production. You saw a changed young man. And that young man started producing, not because you were such a whiz in content. That's not why he changed. He changed because you stayed there in his corner. Despite the challenges he brought your way. Some of you, you went home and you cried over this young man. Some of you, you went home and you threw up your hand. You said to your significant other or somebody in your life, man, I don't even know if I want to continue to do this work. I don't need this. I don't need this frustration. I don't need this aggravation. I can do something else. I've got degrees, I've got credentials, I've got qualification. But then you picked yourself back up and you said, I'm going to make somebody out of you now. See, that's what you did. See, in other words, you transformed Jalil's attitude. You made Jalil a believer in himself. And once Jalil got to that point, where he said, I believe in me. It was a wrap, y'all. Jalil took off. Let me tell you something. There's a, a, a whole slew of Jalils coming to your classes next week. And the difference between their success and their failure is you. That's it. Not, not what's happening outside in the world. But just you. There's this expression, you all know it, this cliche. They say, the power is in your hand. Y'all heard that before, you probably said it. I know I did for years. They said, the power is in your hand. And somewhere along the way, recently, I said, wait a minute. What does that mean? I got power right here? I said, that's not where my power is. I thought about my own trajectory. I said, that's not where my power is. Like, 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 like look at my, tra my trajectory. I'm on this stage, man. It, man, this is big. If you knew my story, this is big. I've given about 2,000 presentations since 19, 1985. It's still big. 1,200 folks from a school district. If you only knew my story. I quit school in grade nine. Some of you know that because you're my social media friends. <laughs> I've, been, I've been retweeting all of y'all. Y'all know it. <laughs> they said, man, shouldn't he be focused on the presentation? He's back at the back of the retweet. <laughs> <laughs> man, 
life, 13 years old, y'all. I didn't go to school. I'm in the streets in East Orange, New Jersey. Man, I'm getting high. Oh, my goodness. I'm drinking malt liquor. Cold 45. <laughs> and I'm just in the streets, man. I'm talking about some of your kids right now through me. I don't want to go to school. I don't need this history lesson. I don't need this math lesson. I don't need this science lesson. I don't need this language arts lesson. What do I need this for? I'm content. So I'm in the streets. My mom, she's so upset, man. She's throwing things at me. Her shoes, I'm feeling up heels upside my head. She's crying. I'm losing my only son. I wish, just like, just like parents are here, superintendent, I wish my mom was sitting here. She's 82 years old. She wished she was here too, I know. But, I went back to school the next year to satisfy her. That's the only reason I went. I love my mother. She was so upset. Okay, Ma, I'll go to school for you. <laughs> so I went for her. A pudding ball, and that kept me in there. But I graduated in five years. I'm the keynote speaker with five years high school. Can you imagine that? <laughs> With a 1.5 GPA. <laughs> I'm talking about, I'm talking to you folks, to that kid that's sitting in your classroom next week that doesn't want to be there. The counselor back in them days, they said, guidance counselor said, have a seat, young man, on the last day before graduation. I sat down. Hey, young man, didn't even call me by my name. Hey, young man, finger going like this. You, you're never going to amount to anything anyway. He didn't see Worcester, Worcester, Worcester. He, he didn't see it coming. <laughs> he didn't see it coming. He just said, young man, you'll never amount to anything. I went on and hit them streets for five more years. I go to school in 84, King University in New Jersey, come out in 86, summa cum laude, 3.95, and have a look at that. <laughs> There's a reason I brought that up. Let's talk about it. We were talking attitude before I deviated. I'm the same guy, y'all. I'm who I am. I walk with a little swag. <laughs> when I became a principal, the prince, my colleagues were saying to me, you, 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 you know you can't walk like that. <laughs> I said, look here, I can't shake that. That was my survival walk, walk for growing, up in, growing up in East Star. That's, that's, that's what kept jokers off my back. I can't change that. That's who I am. So I'm saying I'm still that same cat. Using slang on the stage cat. See, I'm that same guy. What, what shifted, what changed, was my attitude. That's it. I'm not the smartest one in any room I'm in. I was back there with a bunch of kids in the green room. I wasn't the smartest one in that room. <laughs> the ones that were going get dancing. I just work harder than most people. I will admit that. But I'm not the smartest one in the room. So what shifted was attitude. So I say, the power is not in my hand. The power is in my attitude. I'm saying to every educator in this room, the power is in your attitude. The power is in your student's attitude. The question is, is there evidence in your classrooms that young people, their attitudes matter? See, what is the evidence that their attitudes matter in your classroom? In other words, if you detect the youngster is not excited about self, what do you do? Because I promise you, you know this, this is the kid from Jersey re reinforcing it. There will be some children that show up who are not excited about the person in their mirror. 
Just like there are folks in this room who in some of you, in terms of your journey, there were some who had to overcome some barriers and some issues as well who were not necessarily excited about the person in your mirror when you were growing up. See, how did you overcome that? How did you come to grips with the fact that you are somebody? How did you ultimately fall in love with yourself? See, because you can't love other folks if you don't love you. How you gonna love somebody and then you look in the mirror and you don't love you back? So what is the evidence that in your classroom, their attitudes matter? See, what about that youngster that comes to class and there's, a, there's just this inability to dream? See, because his or her world, they're this big. That's it. That's their world. So you and I, we, we can dream these, these big dreams, these big thoughts, these big ideas. But what about when I'm confined to a particular area and I don't realize I have access to the world? I don't realize. I didn't know I had access. I learned that as an adult. I didn't, but I also learned that I, I may have to go an alternate route to get there. I, I learned that just because I work hard doesn't mean I've got a straight path to it. I had to figure all that out though. But what's the evidence in your classroom when we talk about your power is in your attitude? That youngster does in fact have the ability, the capacity to dream beyond an imaginary border around them. See? But then looking at yourselves, what's the evidence that you are passionate about? Some tennis work passionate about children, particularly your students. What's the evidence that my students, man, that's, that's what I live for. That's what I'm all about. I'm all about these kids. I will not accept average. I will not accept mediocrity. You, if you're in my space, I expect you to be striving to be the best version of yourself. What, what is the evidence that that attitude abounds in your classroom. See, we're talking attitude. You make the difference. But then secondly, what's the evidence that this thing called teaching, that this is my thing, see? This is my craft. This is what I do. This is what I cherish. This is mine. See, there's something about being in a classroom with a teacher that says, this is not just my work, but this is my passion. See, this is what I do. This is what defines me professionally speaking. See, that's a different attitude. That's a different person. My work is a teacher. That's what I brought every day. See, my, but, and are there any first year teachers in the, in the house? Put your hand up real high for me. Let me see. How about folks that just completed their first year? say this to you nevertheless. There will be difficult days. But it all boils down to your attitude toward your craft. How much does this thing matter to you? In fact, to the veterans, when that normal frustration sets in, we can never lose sight of or detach ourselves from that younger version of ourselves that said, I want to be a teacher one day. Because we all, we all say, so I want to teach. Well, you didn't stop there. You didn't say I want to teach, period. You said I want to teach because if they hire me, these kids are going to soar like never before. You said that. 
in whatever word, wording that you use. You did not say, if they hire me, well, we'll see what happens. You didn't say that. <laughs> Nobody in this room said that. You said, once they hire me, watch out, world. Things are about to change. What I'm saying to you, you can never lose sight of that person, that younger version of yourself. See, we're talking about the passion that you bring toward your craft. You got to embrace this thing. It's got to be evident to everybody that this is what I do. This is my passion. This is my thing. This is who I am. I was on a stage like this. Let me make the point. May 1st, 2015. Just like this. Had a mic in my hand on that one. So I'm, I'm pacing a little more than I, than I was then, than I am right now. And I'm feeling good. I'm in Miami, University of Miami. It's 200 principals in the audience. I'm feeling great, y'all. Oh, man. One hour keynote like today, and then, yeah, I'm going. I'm, I'm off to the next city. This was in the evening. So I'm pacing, I'm talking to the folks, man. I'm, I'm feeling great, man. Ooh, I, I like how it's going. And then all of a sudden, BAM! A massive heart attack. Like out of nowhere. Where, where's the warning signs? So right on stage, now, so I'm feeling it. It's all in here and here and sweat. All, I see my sweat all over the floor. The crowd is dizzy, I can't see. I'm, I'm tripping over my feet because I'm, I'm stumbling. But I'm like, I'm determined, man. I don't know what's happening to me, but I'm going to finish this speech, man. So I finish. Then I know I got to figure out what's going on. So the, the MC comes back up on the stage. Give Kefele another round of applause. Uh, Principal Kefele, could you take some questions? I'm like, yo, you didn't realize what's happening. I didn't what I <laughs> so, I said, yeah, I'll take questions, right? So 25 people at least lined up, right? So now, I'm like, man, what is going on? I'm in pain. So after the third person, I went over to the podium, just as far as it is for me on this stage, and I leaned on it, and I said to the audience, I think I'm dying, right? <laughs> so they rushed the stage, like all of y'all came up here, right? Lay down. I laid down. Take your shirt off. They took my shirt off. Doctor was in there, the medical guy. He said, well, what are you feeling? I'm in pain, dog. But, but what is it? Like, it's right here, dog. I don't think I'm going to make it, dog. He said, you have a heart attack. Be calm. Be calm, huh? <laughs> I'm trying, dog. It's, it's a lot of pain. We're going to take you to the hospital. OK, dog. But grab my laptop off the podium. <laughs> I need that. Right? So they get me to the hospital, long story short. They get a stent in the arm, right? I'm screaming and yelling. They finally get the stent in. I said, oh my God, I feel better. They said, yeah, but you got diabetes with your heart attack. Right? What? Where was the warning? <laughs> so now, next day, May 2nd, what do you do for a living? I ah, speak to educators. Locally or do you travel? I travel every day. Guess what, sir? That's over. No, 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 no. Ah, that's not over. I got to keep doing that. I'm saving lives. No, that's over, sir. You, you got stopped for at least a couple of months. You almost lost your life last night. Yeah, I know, but that ain't stopped. Tell me what I got to do. Tell me what I, tell me what I got to do to maintain. He said, sir, well, you got to lose all that weight you're carrying. Because I was carrying 260. This new body, y'all, this is 220. <laughs> he said, change your diet. Exercise daily. I said, exercise? Are you kidding me? I said, I do 200 presentations a year. Where, what am I going to exercise? He said, sir, I don't know when you're going to exercise, but them hotels got fitness rooms. Make your way down there. <laughs> That's why I'm getting at midnight on average. These flights are guaranteed delay. He said, well, you're just going to have to be down there. Well, I do 45 minutes a day, y'all. That's what I do. So here's, here's my point, because I'm making a point here. I got back out on the road. They discharged me May 4th. I flew home to Jersey. I got back out on the road full time May 13th, did 85 presentations between May 13th and September 1. Wasn't nothing going to stop me, not even near death. Here's my point. Here's my point. This work I do is my passion. Work you do 
I'm hoping it's your passion. See, I'm passionate about this work. Nothing will stop me from doing what I do. If you maintain an attitude that despite the challenges that young person brings to school, that nothing will stop me because this is my craft. This is my thing. This is what I do. I'm telling you, that's a game changer, y'all. It changes lives. It takes little hard-headed kids that want to get high and drink on these big stages. See? It takes kids that want, to, that want to just sit around and do nothing, sing on social media all day, and next now they're running their own businesses. They're doing big things. That's because of you. Not just the teacher, everybody in this room plays a role. The power is in your attitude. There's not a soul on earth that is better than you, that is more qualified than you. That youngster that's walking into your classroom next week is going to be with the right one. That's an attitude. That's a mindset. And if there's somebody in this room right now and you didn't receive what I just said, that that youngster is walking into a classroom and that youngster will be with the right one, you, if there's someone that did not receive that, you got some work to do between now and then. You got some work to do right in your mirror. I didn't ask for permission to be spiritual, so I won't be. We'll leave that alone. You, you got some work to do on your attitude. Because last time I checked, when teams walk out onto the field, that team that goes out onto the field and looks at the opponent and says, whoa, <laughs> I don't know. That's a team that lost before the game even started. So if you walk out onto that field next week and you look at youngster and say, whoa, I don't know. Not only did you lose, but that youngster lost with you. That youngster lost big time. Yeah. So let me leave you with these five questions. I'm in this self-reflective mode. Those of you that know any of my work, you know that I kind of distinguish myself from the rest, from the pack, I, I could say, in terms of everything I've been writing lately, it's all dealing with being self-reflective. Everything I've been speaking lately, it's all dealing with being self-reflective. Took a, took a risk and wrote a book for principles called The Principle 50, which was comprised of 50 questions, and heavy on questions and light on content. Took a risk. Because I said, I, I want to put a book out there, not that they got to read it all, all month and all year, but just look at these questions and look at themselves and say, am I doing these things? Then I said, let me do one, the same, the same, the same, along the same lines for teachers, 50 questions, heavy on questions, light on content, to get a teacher to look within self. Not reading my words, but look within self. Where do I fit? along this continuum. So took a risk, did it, and what an amazing result. I got to see like all of America reading these two books, right? And it, it's a beautiful thing because it's got people looking within. So I wanna, I wanna throw five at you, and then I'm gonna wrap it up. This self-reflective self question number one. Hey, teacher, are my students at an advantage because I am their teacher. Let that one marinate for a second. I'm going to say it again. Are my students, I'm speaking for everybody in the room, including support staff, are my students at an advantage because, and that's the key word, because I am their teacher. Hmm. In 
In other words, folks, is there something advantageous? Is there something beneficial? Is there something special about the fact that youngsters walking into your classroom and not somebody else's? Something about you, the youngster is, is fortunate enough to be on your roster and not somebody else's roster. Is there some kind of an advantage? Like, oh man, I'm, I'm in Miss So-and-So's class. I'm in Mr. So-and-So or Dr. So-and-So's class. Is there something advantageous? Is there a higher probability that youngster will soar because youngster was assigned to you? I'm telling you folks, you have got to be in that classroom with the mindset. You don't have to articulate, articulate this, share it with a soul. You just have to know within your heart, within your spirit, within your attitude, within your mind, that my students are at an advantage because they got me. That's an attitude because your power is in your attitude. Are my students at an advantage? Advantage because I am their teacher. Question number two. Why do I teach anyway? Why do I do this? You know, in workshop mode, and when I'm at the school tomorrow, poke it on. Poke Never heard of that. Never heard of that. Too. Question. We're just on the surface here, but let, 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 let's, let's look at this. In a workshop setting, I say, well, why do you teach anyway? And it's normal for folks to say, well, I teach to make a difference. Well, I teach to make an impact. I say, oh, no, no. Teacher, that's why everybody teaches. What distinguishes you? What sets you apart? What's your personal why? Your purpose, your reason, your why? See, when I became a teacher in 1988, I hope you guys received this the way I intend for you to receive it. I was born an African-American man, you notice that? <laughs> and growing up, it was evident that I was an African-American man. So when my consciousness evolved, I said, man, I get it now. I can't, I can't lose another one of these boys. I'm going to be a teacher. I went to Brooklyn, Crown Heights section of Brooklyn, New York City, and became a fifth grade teacher in 1988. But I had a specific reason a why, a purpose. I said, those boys, because you know Brooklyn, that part of town, that's, that's all black. It's African American, African Caribbean. I had a class where my boys, not one of them, was in the right grade. Each of them had repeated at least two grades. So they were some old fifth graders. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't even start off really knowing a fifth grade mentality. These were middle school kids in fifth grade classroom. But my mindset was, I'm there because of you. You are my why. You are my purpose. I love my girls. And, and, and anyone that knows me in education knows I love my girls. But my boys were my why. That's a there's a difference there. So now, that meant that everything that I did Pro programmatically revolved around my why. So when I became a principal, I was able to take this thing on another level and create what became a national model of building boys into men. So my why back in 1988 continues to be my why in 2017. See, we're not talking about to make a difference. We're not talking about to make an impact. I want to take these young men and I want to build men. I should say I want to take these young males and I want to build men and I want to show America 
what these inner city boys can become when they're in the right environment. That's a whole different conversation from to make a difference in the lives of children. That's so generic. I'm asking you rhetorically, what's your why? What, what drives you? What's your alarm clock that wakes you up in the morning? That's what your why does. You don't need a clock. You don't have to set your smartphone alarm. Your why will wake you up prior to. Superintendent was up at 3 this morning. I listened. They, they had me back there in the green room. I said, I said to myself, I, I said to Dr. Brown, you, they got to see up there for me. I want to hear some tennis message, right? So I came on up here, and I'm glad I got to hear it. His why is sitting in front of him along with the students. So he couldn't sleep. That's, I mean, I get it. And it's probably several of you that couldn't sleep last night, and you certainly won't sleep the night before kids come back to school. <laughs> so I'm saying... Refine your why. Make it so personal, so specific, that regardless of the challenges that come your way, the obstacles that are in your path, your why will take you right over them, right around them, right under them, right through them. But if you don't have a why, then your day looks like this. You all over the place, man. You, you, you all over the place, just wandering about. People with a why, they, they like this. This is why, people. You can detect them all the time. Because they are focused on achieving their goal. Why you do this? Question number three. How I want to word this. Okay, here we go. Where will your students be 10 years from now as a result of having you as their teacher? See, you and I can't afford to look at kids, and, and, and certainly young people, kids, scholars, children, and youth, they can't afford for us to see them solely for who they are right now. We have to always see them for who and what they will become as a result of being our students. So where will that youngster be? 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, because one year we shared the same space. I'm on a cruise ship a couple years ago, I'll never forget it. And I see a young man, looked like he was in his late 20s, early 30s, and he had this long beard, African American young man. And underneath the beard and the age, he looked like one of my former students. So I said to my wife, I said, that, that guy, you see that guy over there? I think I taught him, and I think I was his principal in eighth grade. She said, well, why don't you go over there and talk to him? I said, because look, this is a nine day cruise, right? I said, imagine that that's not him. And I approach him as if it was him. I'd be embarrassed to see this guy for the next nine days. He didn't see that guy there. He came up to me talking about he was my teacher. Come on. So I said, instead, I'm a, I'm a, when I see him next time I see him, I'm walking somewhere. I'm just going to stop in my tracks and I'm just going to kind of look at him like this. Here. And if that's him, he'll, he'll recognize me, right? So lo and behold, Tuesday, the next day, I see him, and I stop. He said, Chris McAvella. I said, yeah, there it is. So we, we hugged and embraced, we talking, man. He's telling me all he's doing, he's doing big things, trying to buy a trucking fleet, not just a truck of fleet. I said, man, that's big time. That's, that's attitude right there. I said, man, you're doing big things. He said, yeah, I got my family on the cruise ship, man. We, I'm doing good. So, so that was it. I didn't see this young man for the rest of the cruise. The very last day, the very last evening, I'm sitting in the restaurant, and he come walking past my table, so, hey, Chris, look at family. Can I, can I talk to you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, privately. You know, we see the students now, when they're older, and they want to see us privately, we don't know where that's going. <laughs> Good thing weren't right back then. They might want to let you know about it, right? <laughs> so he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, yeah, we went all the way here in the corner. He's a principal of He's talking a little too. He's a principal of I, I, I wanted to tell you this when I saw you on the first day of the cruise, but I, I was embarrassed. I, 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 didn't have, I, I didn't have the guts to say it at the time. 
but I'm good now. So I'm like, man, where's this going? So he said, man, he said, Principal Kefele, I haven't seen you since eighth grade. Eighth grade. He said, but the reason I'm on the ship, the reason I'm the man I am today is for you solely. I'm like, what? He said, it, what you gave me and my peers in eighth grade is what carried us through because we got nothing in high school. We got nothing beyond high school. You gave it to us in grade eight. Now, on the one hand, I'm elated. But hear me well, folks, this is not ego. This is just because I know what we do. On the other hand, I'm not surprised. Here's why. That's what we put the program in place for. Why would I be surprised by the outcomes? Those were the goals. We say, let's put this program in place and give them what they need to get through life. See? Let's give them that kind of message. Not just us. We went out into the community, East Orange and Newark, because half my career was in Newark, the latter half. So in Newark, New Jersey. So we went out and brought in hundreds of men of all walks of life, from the highly successful to the one that did his 10-year bid in jail. And everybody in between, we wanted them all in the building. So now as they're listening to these men and making the dream concrete, so now he can touch this young man and say, man, you mean I can do X, Y, and Z? Yeah, you can. Because the young man said, because I did it. So now he's saying to me, you stayed with me after all these years. I'm saying to you the same thing. Hey, somebody, where will that youngster be that's coming in here next week? Be in 10 years. But here, here's what I'm not asking. I'm not asking you where, where he or she will be. I'm asking you where will they be because you're the teacher. That's a good question. Because you're the teacher, where will that youngster be? Can you see it? Do you have the vision based on the input that you provide? Based on the support that you provide? Based on the love that you provide each and every day? That matters. That matters. And then the last one. question is, do your students or will your students see in you and through you who and what they can become? Huh. Let me say that again. Will they see in you and through you who and what they can become? Can that youngster just take a look at you not that they'll become an educator, some of them will, but that's not what I mean. I mean, they just see the example that you set daily. They see the role model status that you present daily. They see the energy. They see the drive. They see the passion. They see the commitment. They see the dedication. They see the, 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 the attitude, how positive you are. They, they see that. They see it in you, the way, the, just the way you conduct yourself. And now you're providing them with lessons and examples of who they can become and how to get there. Will you be that person? See? That's critical. And I might add, let me add a fifth. What's the evidence that you want to see their success bad? How bad you want to see these kids soar? What are you willing to do? How much of a sacrifice are you willing to make? How much of a commitment are you willing to make toward your craft, your thing, your passion, and toward these young people? So I threw at you these five self-reflective questions. I encourage you guys, go to that mirror every day. In the sports world, they call it game film. And they'll sit in a room like this and look at a screen like that and just analyze, dissect, break down, 
study their film. They will not practice for the next opponent until they have thoroughly broken down the film. The film session forms the basis of preparation for the next opponent. I'm saying to us, if sports puts such a heavy duty emphasis on film, then certainly we as educators have to put a heavy duty emphasis on our own film, but our film is called self-reflection. We go to that mirror, and then within the self-reflection is the self-assessment. We gotta evaluate ourselves. But then ultimately, we've gotta make the adjustment by way of the self-adjustment. We have got to change. We can't be the same person day to day when, we, when the film reveals through the reflection that there's certain interactions maybe I need to change, certain approaches pedagogically that I need to change, whatever it is that I need to change, but we have got to take the film session seriously. That self-reflection, that self-assessment, that self-adjustment. So let me close it out this way. I've been up here now. Let me close it out this way. There's an energy that you gotta bring, that I know you're gonna bring next week. It's the same energy that you brought to this room today. Here's the challenge. I'm on a lot of educator social media pages. And I, I like just kind of laying back and reading stuff without comment. And, and I've noticed there's a lot of folks, they, 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 they're energized right now. They pump, they're ready. But then as I study this thing over the year, over the course of a school year, I noticed that folks are not as energized in October as they were in August. Right? And then I noticed there's a lot of folks that not as energized in December and January and February and April as they were back in August. I'm saying to you, you got to maintain that fire. That fire has got to burn from now until graduation day. It's got to. Because your, your, your students, your children, their lives depend on your fire. Because at the end of the day, and I'll say it until the day I die, that their success is tied to your success. There's so many young people in the world, you know it, and so many people who are sitting in this room. You're in this room as a professional educator or whatever the capacity in which you work because there was somebody that inspired you along the way. There was somebody that said, your life matters. So I'm saying to you, all those variables out there in the world, yeah, they're real. But when they come into your classroom, when they came into my classroom, when they came into my school, I couldn't worry about variables that I had no control or influence over. I had to focus on the variables that I had maximum control and influence over. And that was the inside of my classroom. That was the inside of my school. I'm taking full responsibility for it. So with that said, I want you, everybody, just stand up on your feet for a hot second. Stand up on your feet. Now, I got this, this affirmation, and I want you to hear it. It says, I am the number one determinant of the success or failure of my Students, and I'm putting emphasis on that word my again. I am the number one determinant of the success or failure of my students because once they're in my classroom, they're mine. Once they're in that classroom, they're yours. So I put that emphasis on this word my. You're mine. When you go back home, you're, you're theirs, but you still mine too. And then when you get back in that classroom, I got you again. You, you're mine. So you just heard me recite. Now I want you to repeat after me, but I'm, I'm going low energy on this one. I just want you to kind of kind of feel this thing. But if you disagree with the affirmation, I don't want you to repeat it. Just, just, just fall back and watch the rest of us. Right? But don't, don't say something that you don't feel. So repeat after me, no energy, okay. just, let's, let's just say it together. I am, I am the, the number one determinant number one determinant of the success of the success or failure, or failure 
of my, of my students. students. Now, next week, folks, go in there. I'm getting ready to step off this stage. Go in there believing them, feeling them, embracing them, knowing that these children, their success is tied to your success. Know that. So, but not with the energy that we just expressed. <laughs> not that. I'm getting ready to give it all I got, y'all. I want you to share that with me. I'm going to give it everything I got. Hit it with me the same way. Okay. And then keep this with you for the duration of the school year. You ready? Yeah. Yeah. Here we go. Let's, let's do this right. I am! Determinant. Number one determinant of the success of the success or failure or failure of my of my students. students. I didn't hear y'all. Let's do this again. I am. I am the, the number one determinant. Number one determinant of the success of the success or failure. So together we are going to make that difference. I'm humbled and honored to work with you as your leader, and I look forward to a great school year. And together we will make a difference. Can I hear you say that? We, we will, will make a difference. Thank you. Before you leave, we have a video we want you to, to watch. And at the conclusion of the video, 
I know you have uh, professional development and places to be today by 1 o'clock. But please enjoy a nice lunch somewhere with your colleagues and friends. And don't rush, but be back by 1 o'clock. Uh, thank you. It's been a great morning. as you watch this video and throughout the day, share your thoughts with us on social media. Thank you and have a good day.